From the series Mysterious Circumstances, we present Michael Dennison and Dulcie Gray in Shadow of a Magnitude, a play for radio by Michael Robson. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mrs. Farrell? That's right. Oh, do come in, please. I'm Charles Hazelhurst. Mm. The agent said the hall was spacious. And he was right. Uh, but I understand it's a large house you're looking for. Certainly. Have you lived here long? Uh, Sixteen years. You'll be sorry to leave it, I imagine. It's quite beautiful. Thank you. We've been very happy here. Uh, well, uh, where would you like to start? Do you know I think the grounds first, don't you? I have a feeling it'll be raining hard before long, if the sky is anything to go by. Then the grounds it shall be. Uh, I hope you enjoy walking. There's quite an acreage to cover. It's half past twelve. It's taken us almost two hours to see the whole place. Well, about par for the course. Uh, that's why the agent and I like to feel reasonably sure that someone's serious about buying before we embark on the grand tour with them. I can imagine. You'd waste a good deal of time otherwise. Uh, Absolutely. Then let me reassure you. I am serious about buying. Very serious. I'm delighted to hear it. Uh, That calls for a drink, I should have thought. Uh, We've certainly earned one. What a good idea. Uh, What would you like? Oh, gin and tonic, please. No, getting closer. We could do with a storm. It's almost impossibly humid. Would it be impertinent of me to ask why you're leaving here? Uh, Not in the least. It's far too big for one man. Uh, now then, if there's not enough gin, for heaven's sake, let me know. Thank you. My wife always insisted on one part gin to four parts tonic. I suppose I got stuck in the groove. This is fine, really. Good. Your wife is dead. Uh, yes. It was not a freak, the chance in a million that killed her. Oh. Uh, we were in Australia at the time, Melbourne. She was in a lift some 24 stories up when the safety mechanism went fat. The lift fell like a stone all the way down. Simone and the other three occupants were killed outright. How appalling. A chance in a million, they said. If there was a chance in ten million of the thing being unsafe, they should never have marketed it. Oh, you have children, though. Uh, two. Now, they're adults now, of course, and they don't have many opportunities to come up here, which is another reason why I'm selling. Oh, they loved the place when they were younger. Friends constantly here, parties, dances, the house was alive. Uh, that's them uh, over there in the photograph. Oh, yes. Nice looking boys. It's Simone they take after. Uh, Robin, the taller one with the scarf, uh, he's in the foreign office, and young John is a barrister. You must be very proud of them. Oh, uh, they've done quite well for themselves. Indeed, they have. And you, uh, clearly, you have children? Yes, a boy and a girl. Nice to have one of each. It makes life interesting. Yes, I'm sure. And the house will be for them, of course, as it used to be for Robin and Johnny. I think it'll suit them down to the ground. May I ask how old they are? I'm... I, I'm sorry. I was distracted for a moment. It must have been the thunder. It worries you? Not in the least. Uh, the children. Leon is 18 and James is 21. Well, it couldn't be better. Think of the fun they could have here. And all the time in the world to enjoy it, uh, if they decide to work locally. Yes, all the time in the world. Are you living in London at present? Bristol. Ah, quite close, but not too close. Uh, how long does it take you to drive down here? About three quarters of an hour. Pleasant journey. Yes, it is, isn't it? Oh, the motorways made life much easier, of course, but what a relief to get off it and back to sanity. Yes. Uh, are you ready for another one? Not just the moment, thank ah. you. Then perhaps you'll forgive me if I... Um... Please. Uh, what are you doing about lunch? I haven't given it a thought. I'm afraid there's nothing suitable I can offer you here, but there's a very pleasant pub in the village where they really do serve rather good meals. Uh, perhaps you care to join me? It's very kind of you, really, but it's not necessary. Uh, nevertheless, I very much hope you'll come along. All right. Thank you. Good. Well, then, let me top up that drink. Uh, there's plenty of time. Gustav, the chap who does the cooking in the pub, doesn't get into his stride until half past one at least. <laughs> what on earth is he doing till then? 
preparing the terrines, I shouldn't wonder. Now, one of gin to four of tonic. There you are. Thank you. You must miss your wife very much. Well, I'm fortunately kept very busy. Work tends to blur the edges a bit. If I were here much, I'd find it unbearably depressing. Uh, too many memories. There's nothing worse than happiness remembered in unhappy times. Yes, I know, I know. Oh, this is a marvellous place, marvellous, but not for me, not now. You have somewhere else to live? Uh, we had a house in Knightsbridge when we were first married. I kept it on after we bought this place. I'm in London frequently on business, and Simon liked her visits to town. Johnny, uh, he's the barrister, has what's virtually a flat on the third floor, so we can keep in touch without living in each other's pockets. That must be very nice for both of you. You'll discover as your two grow up, when they find their feet, that you'll stop regarding them as children and think of them as friends. One of the compensations of middle age. You know, it's quite extraordinary. What is? Well, I've been looking at country houses like this for about four months now. What an extraordinary variety of people you meet. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> You'd have to forgive my grasshopper mind. But when you were talking about your wife and children, I was reminded of a conversation I had with someone quite recently. Of the contrast between the two of you. In what way? A short time ago, I looked over a large house and grounds, larger, in fact, than we really need. But it sounded so attractive on paper that I decided to have a look anyway. Like you... The owner did me the courtesy of showing me around himself. But there the resemblance ends. Anyway, the long and the short of it all is that as we walked round, as this man talked, I realised I knew who he was. Now, who could he have been, I wonder? Let's just say it's a man you'd certainly know. He was selling for very much the same reason as you are. His wife had died in an accident. His sons were leading their own lives and the place had become far too big for him. But what was so dreadful was his attitude. In what way? I may have overreacted once I knew who he was, of course, but I don't think so. He was one of those people who had immense talent and driving ambition, but absolutely no money of his own. So, he married cleverly and well. She came from a titled family, and she had access to the finance he needed to begin his company. He's done very well, of course. Remarkably well. And I don't doubt he'll end up in the House of Lords. But his wife, she adored him, I believe, but he simply used her for her money, her prestige, and her connections. He wanted sons and heirs. She obliged him. He wanted an accomplished hostess and a country seat, and she was the answer. But as for love, I think, if anything, he despised her because she was so gullible and so gentle. She died, as I mentioned, in an accident. There was some question of negligence by a third party. The husband with the aid of the best legal brains in the country, sued. He was awarded enormous damages. He gave his wife a funeral every bit as sumptuous as the wedding had been, and that was that. To him, it was like having a very expensive car that's ruined in an accident. Sue the person unfortunately responsible, take the money, and look round for a replacement as soon as you sensibly can. And you say I know this man? Bound to. What I've told you is common knowledge. If that's so, why not tell me who he is? Wouldn't that be unprofessional? I'm sure you wouldn't like me gossiping about you all over the country and naming you by name. <laughs> My dear Mrs. Farrell, it wouldn't give me a moment's uneasiness, I assure you. No, perhaps it wouldn't. You're a very self-confident man. Is that a criticism or a commendation? Only a comment. You aren't lacking in confidence yourself. I wasn't always like this, believe me. I don't believe you. But I'm very glad you came this morning. Oh, why? Because of all the people who've looked around here recently, you're the only one I can see fitting in. Absolutely. And naturally, I want to sell, and as soon as possible. But I'd rather not sell to someone who wouldn't value it and grace it, as I'm sure you would. You're very complimentary. But for that very reason, I feel I should remind you that if you do decide to buy the house, your financial commitments don't end there. I wouldn't want you going home full of enthusiasm, talking it over with your husband, and suddenly realizing you have very considerable overheads to face. And in any event, uh, your husband will want to see the place as well, presumably. Uh, perhaps he'll be less enthusiastic than you appear to be. If a decision has to be made, it'll be mine, and mine only. Then he must have remarkable confidence in you, Mrs. Farrell. 
Not many men will saddle themselves with something as big as this without wanting to do their own investigating. I'd like to tell you about my husband. Oh, of course. Tom's father was a vicar in a country parish in Lincolnshire. There were three children. Tom was the youngest. The parents were prepared to lead lives of genteel poverty in order to give the children the best possible education. Tom went to a minor public school and took a scholarship to Manchester University. He read engineering and eventually got a creditable degree. It would have been a first if he hadn't spent his last year battling with nervous asthma. Oh, what a terrible thing. Mm. He taught for a while at the university. Then he was offered a position in the research and development section of an engineering firm just outside Bristol. The pay was almost derisory, but Tom was attracted to the work. They were developing forms of apparatus to make maimed ex-servicemen and badly injured civilians more mobile. Mm, excellent work. He'd been there a year when I met him. He was the only completely selfless man I've ever known. We married, we had two children, and the firm began to prosper. As it prospered, Tom's responsibilities increased and his nervous asthma returned. Mm. But he wouldn't leave off what he was doing because he was too involved. And then... Seven years ago, a new drug came onto the market. Something that would relieve chronic asthmatics without their needing recourse to oxygen machines and the like. He was halfway through the first month's course of the new drug when he died. He was 40. But the drug itself wasn't responsible for his death. All patients taking the drug were warned that it was highly dangerous to touch alcohol at the same time. Alcohol, Mr. Hazelhurst. But Tom was always drinking coffee. And it was the combination of caffeine and the drug that killed him. You've taken two and a half hours of my time to lead up to this. Why bother with the farce of a guided tour first? You were here, you had access to me. Why the charade beforehand? Would you have listened if you hadn't thought that I was seriously interested in buying the house? Would you have offered me drinks and lunch and been prepared to put up with a few biographical details if you hadn't thought that there was at least a fighting chance of a sale? My company has made financial reparations? After six years, yes. After six years of chicanery and evasions. After being shamed into it by the campaigns of a few hard-nosed Fleet Street men. But never willingly. No firm willingly parts with almost a million pounds. Exhaustive inquiries had to be made first into every case of death. The findings were published within a year of the death. Mrs. Farrell, I hope you've received some satisfaction from telling me this, but now I think you'd better go. It isn't the whole story. I think you had better go. Are you going to throw me out physically? I hope that won't be necessary. It may be, because I intend to finish the story. What makes you suppose I shall stay to hear you out? Because if you leave me alone, I shall destroy every painting in this room, and you'd be obliged to send for the police, and there'd be a scandal when it became known who I am in relation to what you are. I'll give you five minutes, then I shall telephone the police, scandal or no scandal. You will give me as long as it takes. I don't want to take legal action against you, but I shall without hesitation if you aren't out of this house by one o'clock. It'll be over by then, I can assure you. Well, then. Well, then. Tom's firm did what they could financially after his death, but it couldn't compare with what he'd been earning when he was alive. And the children, in addition to losing their father, they had to leave the schools they were attending. All that was confusing enough. But what finally disintegrated them was the attitude of you and your fellow directors. Cynical, temporizing, attempting to avoid all responsibility, letting the whole thing drag on year after year, the unacceptable face of capitalism. Your reparations were made last September, and by then it was much too late. My daughter Leone was found dead in a back street off Covent Garden of an interesting combination of malnutrition blood poisoning and heroin. My son is a mercenary soldier. I haven't heard from him for over a year. He may be in Africa, I don't know. He may be dead, I don't know. It sounds grotesque, doesn't it? The kind of thing that just doesn't happen to normal people. But until my husband began that course of drugs that your chemists had pronounced suitable for sale, we were a normal, happy and united family. I'm sorry. You are? But however exhaustive the tests that are made, you're going to find that any major pharmaceutical breakthrough 
uh, though it relieves the suffering of hundreds of thousands, may be fatal to an infinitesimal few. That accident in the lift, the one that killed your wife, what were your comments to me not 20 minutes ago? A chance in a million, the manufacturer said. But if there was a chance in 10 million of the things being unsafe, they should never have marketed it. That was your conclusion. So how does that square with your attitude towards the drug? As a visitor to my house, you've come out with what you certainly consider to be a number of statements that I would find unpalatable and distressing. Very well. You've stated your case. Now I think it's my turn. You still haven't answered my last question. There was a flaw in the lift mechanism, and there was a flaw in the drug you peddled. Both resulted in the deaths of innocent people. So what's the difference? I prefer to concentrate on your situation, not mine. Your husband died seven years ago. You tell me that as a direct result of that, your daughter's dead and your son's gone to the bad. But you, you've survived. People get over all manner of personal tragedies if they have the character. You're answer. suggesting that my children lack character. It very much appears so. Why weren't they rallying round you when you most needed them? They were children. They were adolescents. And if your husband was the man you represented him to be, surely there was enough of his influence left to help them to lead useful lives. Mrs. Farrell, in bad times, some survive and some go to the wall. They lack the moral fiber to conduct themselves properly. They complain about life instead of standing up to it. That's your world, then. Of course it would be. In my world, Mr. Hazelhurst, there are the givers and the takers. And you have taken all your life. I want you to leave now. Make me. Had you behaved differently, less arrogantly, I might have had some sympathy for you. Uh, but not now. Arrogant. Uh, Sergeant Hopper, uh, uh, this is Charles Hazelhurst, Sergeant. I'm having some trouble at my home. A woman came here this morning on the pretext of being interested in buying the place. In fact, she's trespassing and I've asked her to leave. She refuses. Yes. Yes. No physical threats. No. Uh, not to me, at least. I'll explain when you get here. If you've left before he arrives, I shall attempt to forget this visit of yours. You have rather less than ten minutes. So have you. What the hell are you talking about? When your reparations finally came through after the hubbub the newspapers caused, I went looking for my daughter. The time and money I spent in the search. And the people I met. Pimps and protection men and seedy private investigators, prostitutes, drug addicts. And worse... And I learned how easy it is to get certain things done if you have the money and the connections. So we finally caught up with Leone, and she was dead. And when I realized the filth and the squalor and the misery she died in, I made a decision about you, Mr. Hazelhurst. I decided to kill you. First it was Tom, and then it was Leone. So I decided to kill you. Because the law would never touch you. There's a man in Wandsworth who sells foreign handguns, Mr. Hazelhurst. Handguns that can't be traced in this country. So I bought a revolver and 200 rounds of ammunition. You realize I shall report all this to Harper when he arrives? I practiced in the disused quarry in Bedfordshire. It isn't so difficult to hit a mark when the range is ten yards or less. And I still have a lot of bullets left. You're becoming very tedious. From the moment your firm refused to pay out compensation, I began to keep a file on you and your firm, and on everything the newspapers printed about the wrangle. It wasn't difficult to find out where you lived and how you lived. But have you any conception of what a normal human being has to go through before she can make up her mind to kill another human being? Have you? Normal human beings don't behave as you're doing. You need a psychiatrist. Is that all you can say? Someone should have said it months ago, evidently. But why do I need a psychiatrist? Can you answer that? Oh, for God's sake, will you shut up? You're not a man who likes home truths unless you're uttering them, are you? By God, you're going to regret ever coming to this house. But not as much as you will. What do you expect to achieve by behaving in this way? What do you expect to achieve? I wanted to discover what you were really like, and now I know it. You've made me lose my temper. Congratulations. You must have heard of the optimist who reminds you that this is the first day of the rest of your life. 
What are you on about now? But how would you feel if you knew that this was the last day of the rest of your life? Uh, this is all very extravagant and unnecessary, Mrs. Farrell. You've angered me, you've upset me, and it's all gone on much too long. Now, just get out before you find yourself in serious trouble. Serious trouble? A husband dead, a daughter dead, a son as good as dead, and you talk about serious trouble. Your husband was a biological freak, your daughter was a neurotic, and your son's a pathological killer, and you have the effrontery to hold me responsible? I hope for your sake that you have a very good solicitor, because I promise you you're going to need the best there is. You're feeling suddenly inadequate because for the first time in your life you've come face to face with your conscience and you don't like what you see. I see a hysterical and vicious woman and I don't like what I see. <sighs> I'm going to have another drink. Do you intend to stop me? Are you prepared to brawl with a hysterical and vicious woman? But this time, three parts gin... And one part tonic. This morning, before I left home, I was physically sick. Before I turned into your drive, I was sick again. Because I knew that in all probability, I would have to kill you. And until I met you, perhaps for a few minutes when we first talked in here, I felt a great relief because I began to believe that I might have been wrong that you might feel remorse for the havoc you caused and the terrible delay you insisted on before this arbitrary compensation was made. Threats to my life. You're madder than I thought. But I was wrong. You were everything I knew you must be. Complacent, arrogant, unimaginative, and utterly without compassion. All right. Now, look here. Put it away. Put that stupid gun away. Stay there. Stay exactly where you are. This is ludicrous. Are you determined to go to prison? I shall have to. Because even if it was possible for me to kill you and escape, I couldn't do so. I have a social conscience, you see. Put it away. Put, put it away and I'll do the best I can for you when Harper arrives. But put it away. Do you believe me now? I believe you're very ill and you need treatment. But will you accept that you are the reason for what you call my illness? We were conducting a war against a serious affliction. And in winning that war, a few, a very few unfortunate people died. But you shoot a general because a handful of his soldiers are killed... If only you'd look at it rationally. If there was one chance in ten million of the lifts being unsafe, they should never have put it on the market. All right, all right, all right. But I didn't threaten to kill the manufacturers, did I? I used the law. Because you had the money to buy the best than the law could offer. We went to the law as well. Those of us who were left without husbands or wives or parents or children after your drug had struck home. But we didn't carry the guns, you did. You flicked us away like so many fleas and year after year went by and still you were offering nothing. And you haven't altered now the same inhuman callousness. I'm tired. And I'm desperate. And I'm frightened. More frightened than I've ever been in my life. But not of you. Of the anger inside me. And of the long, slow horror I'll have to go through when you are dead. If... If you'll allow me to go over to my desk, I'll make out a banker's draft in your favour for £50,000. Take it and go now, and I'll forget that you were ever here. You can't buy me off. Then what do you want? What do you want of me? Give me back my son and my daughter and my husband. If I could, I would. Only because you're looking down the muzzle of a gun. If you really felt any compassion at all, you'd have felt it seven years ago. Mrs. Farrell, if I wanted to, I could get out of this room fast, and the odds are that you'd miss me by a mile, if you even tried a shot at me, which I doubt. So, put the gun down carefully on that table, and let's discuss this matter sensibly. Why ruin your life for an impulse? Because you've got to be punished. You and men like you have got to be punished by someone. And if the law won't do it, then I must. You got away with it. And already people have forgotten what it's like for those of us left behind. But the money was paid... After six years, yes. And with the greatest reluctance. And only because by holding out any longer, you knew that you'd be damaging the image of your company. You weren't concerned with human values, only with commerce. And what is money? It can't buy back Tom. And the only... Put the gun down. Put it down. That's him. That's Harper. 
And some came running. I'm warning you. And I'm warning you. I shall plead not guilty because I want a full trial. And I shall go into the witness box so that I can tell them exactly what drove me to this. An hysterical woman who waved the gun around? You pay dearly for the way you behave today. I promise you... Don't answer it. We haven't finished yet. You idiot. You perfect idiot. Oh! You wouldn't believe me, would you? In Shadow of the Magnitude by Michael Robson, Charles Hazelhurst was played by Michael Dennison and Ruth Farrell by Dulcie Gray. The producer was Derek Hoddenot.